for PTSD, first of all, how do we diagnose PTSD? Um, the sort of gold standard today is the clinician administered PTSD scale or CAPS. Uh, it's a detailed interview. It's actually 17 pages long. So the, uh, an experienced uh, uh, clinician, usually a psychologist or perhaps a social worker who's been trained in administering this instrument, spends about an hour with the patient going through asking them these questions over the course of an hour or so. Um, we have more brief measures, and I guess the briefest is a four-item uh, questionnaire, so the patient answers four questions. It's called the PC-PTSD uh, scale, so if, uh, I think it stands for primary care PTSD. So, you know, if you're in a busy setting and you want to just do something brief, you can ask these four questions. And if they have two or more positive responses, it's probably the best correlation uh, with having PTSD. Uh, in the military, we actually use that uh, for everybody returning from combat. Uh, so. Uh, if you're deployed, you have to do the PC, PC PTSD, those four questions. Um, a, uh, you know, kind of next step up from that, which we often use, is called the PTSD checklist. And this is a 17-item questionnaire. So again, it's self-administered. takes a minute or two for a patient to do that, as opposed to the hour or so with the clinician. And it has a pretty good correlation with the CAPS. Now, all of those rely on the report of the patient. Uh, so, you know, say they've had a TBI, they may not remember things as well, or there are a variety of reasons why somebody might not um, be completely truthful. I mean, you know, service members are afraid of stigma, that if they acknowledge symptoms of PTSD, uh, it might affect their promotion, it might affect their career uh, assignments, things like that. So they might not tell you all their symptoms. Um, so that's where I think that, you know, we're, we're moving into the arena where we're developing more confidence in truly objective measures, not just self-report. And so one of those is the functional MRI, like I talked about. See, as I said, there are several areas of the brain where there are definitely reproducible differences uh, in those who have PTSD versus those who don't, even if they've been exposed to the same sort of trauma. And uh, that's a potentially good way, but it's pretty expensive. So, you know, a functional MRI costs upwards of $1,000. So probably not practical for us to administer that to every service member when they return from deployment. Um, another measure that we've used is uh, psychophysiology. So um, exposing somebody to stimuli, and you probably are familiar with uh, uh, Pavlov's dog, you know, so Pavlov, more than 100 years ago, he had a dog and he would uh, um, basically uh, present it with food and he, you know, did these experiments where he would say, ring a bell and then present the food. And the dog would learn, whenever I hear the bell, I'm going to get the food. So he would start to salivate just with hearing the bell. So we can do the same sort of thing and there's a lot of different ways to do that kind of experiment. Um, so the one that we use is... Um, we actually show some certain shapes and colors on a computer screen. And uh, so one pattern of shapes and colors will be followed by a loud, n loud noise. And then we, we hook up uh, some tubes and we have a, a tube hooked to an oxygen tank that provides a powerful puff of air right here, right at the front of the throat. And that's not absolutely painful, but it's definitely uncomfortable. Uh, so anybody reacts to that puff of air at the front of the throat. And, you know, so blood pressure tends to go up, heart rate goes up, you sweat more, um, you blink your eyes uh, faster and more. So we can measure all of those things, measure that response. And, you know, basically the same thing. When they see this pattern of shapes and colors, they know this is going to happen. They start reacting to those shapes and colors on the screen even before they get that puff of air. If they see a different pattern of shape, shapes and colors, uh, they get the loud noise but not the puff of air. And so we can look at um, this in people with PTSD and those who don't have PTSD, we see definite differences. Um, typically we get a greater reaction overall in those with PTSD. They sweat more, their heart rate goes up more, things like that. Um, and um, we tend to um, even see a greater reaction 
when they get the safety cues, when they're, they see those shapes and colors that where they don't get the puff of air, it's almost like they, they're not really trusting what they're seeing. They're not trusting what's presented with them, to them, and they react more to those. So that where they learn the association between the shapes and colors and, and those different types of stimuli, that's what we call fear acquisition. They learn what they should be afraid of, you know, what's going to be, what's the danger cue, and what's the safety cue. Then we do, after that, we have um, a period where we call it fear inhibition. So we present them with a mix of shapes and colors. So they get one that's associated with the danger and one that's associated with the safety. And, you know, so then there's uncertainty. We, we don't um, give them the puff of air then, but they're still, it, it's kind of confusing. Like, wait a minute, you told me one set was, or, you know, one set meant danger, one set meant safe. What does this stuff together mean? That, that mixes me up. And we sent, tend to see greater responses across the board in those who have PTSD uh, in that what we call fear inhibition phase. Then we do a fear extinction. Now we don't show them that confusing set of symbols again. We go back to the, the danger cues and the safety cues. But no matter what cue they get, there is no air blast. You know, it, it's safe. And we ask them, actually we have them right after they see the thing on the computer, the, the shapes before they actually get the puff of air or just the noise. Um, we ask them to press a button saying either they think it's going to be danger, they think they're going to get the air blast, or they think it's going to be safe or they're not sure. And what we see is that those who have PTSD in that fear extinction phase where there's nothing else, you know, there are no more air blasts, no more danger, both those with and without PTSD will tell you cognitively, it's okay now. You know, I'm going to get safety. I'm, I'm not getting hit with that air blast anymore. But physiologically, we see big differences. So those with PTSD, their heart rate goes up more. Um, they, um, they sweat more. Their eyes are blinking more. You know, so it's a really profound difference. This is... You know, doing the physiology like that, I mean, it takes maybe an hour to do the whole experiment. So it takes some time, I mean, but, you know, maybe it costs more like $100 or 150 or something rather than 1000 uh, for the scan.